Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Okay, hello. Thanks for being here today. I know there's a lot of interesting panels going on, so we are very happy that you're here with us. My name is Lauren Singer Katz, and I am the Outreach and Advocacy Manager at the Utah State Archives um, and Record Service. Thanks for joining us. This is called At the Source How to Find Water Resources in the Archives. So I'm just going to begin by introducing our panelists, and then each of them will do a short presentation for you. Um, Mahala, here, raise your hand, Mahala. Hello has been with the Utah Division of Archives and Records Service since 2018. She works as an archivist with the local government program and serves as executive secretary for the Utah State Historical Records Advisory Board, which provides resources to organizations throughout the region for preservation of and access to historical records. Mahala is passionate about promoting the work of archivists and encouraging public engagement with primary source materials. She has a master's degree in history from the University of New Hampshire, where she studied the early American Republic and religious identity in the American West. Mahala has worked in archives, special collections, and museums for 10 years. Um, Gordon here, Gordon, hello, is the curator of research and instruction services and the curator of the Yellowstone Collection in the L. Tom Perry Special Collections at Brigham Young University. He holds an undergraduate degree in history from BYU, a master's degree in history from the University of Chicago, a certificate in archives and records management from Western Washington University, and a doctorate in educational leadership from Brigham Young University. His research interests include Western exploration, development of primary source liter literacy skills, the history of the archival profession in Utah, the history of higher education in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and business process management as applied to archives. Lisa, down at the end, hello Lisa, is the Historical Collections Curator for Utah Division of State History's Library and Collections Program, and she oversees its manuscript, photograph, and maps collection. She received her BA and MA from the University of Utah in History with certificates in public history and historic preservation. And finally, an advocate for leveraging libraries to support community development, Sam, wave hello, director of the Uinta County Library and Heritage Museum in Northeast Utah. He is an enthusiast for all things open source and libraries and is the co-founder of the Basin Libraries Consortium in Utah. Sam previously taught courses in the Organization of Information, Archives, and Building Library Facilities for Emporia State University. In 2012, he led the successful $9.5 million capital campaign and construction for a new 32,000 square foot library building. He has an MS in library science from the University of North Texas and a BS in social studies education from BYU Idaho. I will pass the mic now to Mahala. So hello everyone. Um, as Lauren said, my name is Mahala and I work at the State Archives. Um, and I'm just going to introduce this panel a little bit um, in the context of Archives Month. So um, we are putting this together as part of the initiative of Archives Month, which is promoted by the National Archives and the Society of American Archivists. And it's meant to raise awareness of the work of archivists and the value of archival records. Um, Utah uh, Archives Month is supported by the USHRAB, um, as well as the Division of Archives and Records Service. Archival records protect the rights, property, and identity of our citizens. Archival records are essential to support society's increasing and healthy demand for accountability and transparency in government, public, and private institutions. And archivists keep records that have enduring value as reliable memories of the past and they help people find and understand the information that they need in those records. So utaharchivesmonth.org, this is our um, work. Uh, <laughs> um, we've been working hard this year to make this a truly statewide effort. Um, so we've been reaching out to a lot of memory institutions to encourage the promotion of historical records, especially those related to water. Um, the USHRAB has been coordinating with State History, Utah Humanities, Museum Field Services, and more. 
together research guides, digital collections, and more to share on the website. So definitely check it out um, after the session or now. You can pay attention to the website if you want to instead of me. Um, so why water? Water is our theme this year. Um, and thankfully it aligned very well with the state, um, state history's theme as well for this conference. And water is just kind of a hot topic right now as we are very aware of. Um, water is a geographic story. It affects the time and place um, in which we live and records document this story. Um, so, that is what we're trying to focus on um, both in this panel and then also just the general work and outreach that we're doing with Archives Month. So I also just wanna say, um, introduce the State Archives a little bit. So the State Archives is the division that um, is mandated to manage and preserve government records in Utah. We do both active records management assistance as well as historical records preservation to state agencies, cities, towns, counties, schools, courts, and more. We're also mandated to facilitate access to these records, um, which takes the form of finding aids and other research tools, as well as in-person research appointments. This is our mission statement. Um, we are uh, here to create innovative solutions that will assist Utah government agencies in the efficient management of their records, and to preserve records of enduring value. Um, so as the State Archives, we only hold government created records of permanent historical value. Examples include governor's correspondence, city council minutes, vital records like birth and death uh, certificates, cemetery interment registers, naturalization records, and more. We typically don't have personal collections like manuscripts, family scrapbooks, and newspapers. So we have uh, around 1.7 million items online in our digital archives, but this only amounts to about 3% of our entire holdings. So definitely keep that in mind as you're browsing through what we have online. It's definitely not everything. Um, digitized records are available for free on our website and accessible anywhere with an internet connection. So in the context of this panel uh, specifically, I'm gonna be talking mainly about uh, the Colorado River records that we have in our collection. Um, the Colorado River is one of the most legally regulated uh, records on earth, or sorry, rivers on earth. Um, and so we have a lot of that, a lot of the laws and um, documents surrounding that regulation actually in our holdings. So we have a huge variety of records documenting the state's ongoing planning and management of the Colorado River. Examples of records from state and local levels include the Colorado River Commission case files, Division of Water Resources project files, Department of Transportation photos, governor's records, including project files, correspondence, executive assistance records, Office of Tourism, promotional material, Salt Lake Water Commission records, interstate compacts from the Secretary of State's office, um, litigation records from the Board of Land Commissioners, state engineer files, minutes and correspondence from Planning Board and the Water and Power Board, and a whole host of records that are related to um, water rights litigation as well that uh, is adjudicated by the district courts at the county level. So many of these records are found on our website by browsing our research guides, our exhibits, and our digital archives, which uh, you can access there. Well, not literally on the slide, but. Um, so the pro a project from the last um, couple of years has been digitizing uh, tens of thousands of documents associated with the Colorado River Compact. These records are now available on our website. Um, which again, you can see on the slide. So the compact was the result of a series of negotiations in 1922 between Arizona, California, Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming. The purpose was to enter into a compact authorized by an act of Congress, which would provide for equitable distribution and apportionment of, waters, of the waters of the river system, of the Colorado River system. Um, protection of said waters, and resolution of water-related controversies between states. 
Utah was represented at the negotiations by state engineer R.E. Caldwell, who was appointed by Governor Dern. And major provisions of the compact have di dictated all development made on the river in the hundred years since. Negotiations had been years in the making. They'd first begun around 1917. And the numerous compacts, laws, treaties, court decrees, contracts, and regulatory guidelines um, have become that uh, have become known as the law of the river. So the compact allowed for irrigation of the Southwest as well as development of state and um, federal waterworks projects like Hoover Dam and Lake Powell. At the time of the compact, de development was the main concern. And since 1922, damming and use of river water has had an undeniable effect on the natural ecosystem, including a de decrease of native fish species, reduction in silt deposits along floodplains, and changes in the water temperature. It's well documented that water within the river system has been over allocated. Initial estimates were for a flow of 17 million acre feet per year, but the actual flow is often less than a third of that amount. Um, the State Archives digital collection on the Colorado River Compact includes records from the Attorney General's office, governor's records, state engineer's files, and records from the Secretary of State. The Commission's case files include legal records, correspondence, and reports. Um, they also include legal papers related to the Arizona versus California Supreme Court case that set precedent for water rights litigation. Um, Governor Dern's records include speeches, correspondence, minutes, and reports related to Utah's role in the negotiation. And remember, it was Governor Dern who appointed Caldwell, who um, the state, was the state engineer who represented uh, the state at the um, negotiations. And then the state engineer's records include project files such as the Boulder Canyon project um, in 1928, which led to the construction of, the, of Hoover Dam and the filling of Lake Mead, um, as well as water appropriations rosters. So it's really hard to overstate the importance of the um, law of the river on development and the future of the West. The compact set in motion um, interstate water litigation processes as well as agricultural and economic development. The compact and the law of the river raised many questions for researchers and the public to investigate. We need to ask ourselves about environmental impacts of development along the river and water storage projects that make that development possible. Drought has given us the unique opportunity to ask specific and poignant questions about projects like the Glen Canyon Dam and Lake Powell. Um, and we need to consider the give and take between local and federal governments, public and private in industries from utilities to agriculture and relations with tribal groups. Collections like this are a good starting point. Um, this collection was digitized in part to mark the 100 year anniversary of the negotiation of the compact and in part because we recognize it as a relatively untapped resource for researchers on an increasingly prescient topic. Um, water is obviously a hot button issue and drought is a reality that we are obligated to acknowledge and deal with. Um, it's our responsibility to understand and learn from the past as we approach our future. So I only talked about one single topic today, but I do want you all to know that that is not even close to the only water related resources that we have in our holdings. Um, feel free to peruse our research guide, digital exhibits, finding aids, the Utah Archives Month site. Um, we are here to help. We have a reference team to facilitate research, um, and I've put some contact info up here, so get in touch with us. Okay. Uh, so as was mentioned, my title is Curator of Research and Instruction Services, and that's one of the reasons that I'm here to talk to you. Uh, I am representing academic libraries and the kinds of resources that academic libraries and special collections have related to water issues, particularly how you go about finding those. Uh, I will put in a caveat at the beginning. I am not an expert in water. This is not my area um, of study or of interest. Uh, other than that didn't come out quite right. Other, other than the fact that I, I know how to find materials. And, and so I'm, I'm leveraging my abilities um, in, in that particular context. Um, my predecessor used to say that he was a, a jack of all trades and master of none. 
And I feel, um, that's how I feel sometimes. I know we've got water related resources in our holdings and I know that there's value to them, but I don't have the deep dive. But what I do understand is how to utilize the tools that we have available uh, in uh, at particularly the BYU library for finding materials. Uh, and I'm going to talk about two tools. One of them is specific to the BYU context. That's the Harold Beely Library search portal. Uh, it's known as Scholar Search. Uh, the second is a more wider, uh, a more uh, broad tool. It's the Western Waters Digital Library. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But first, let's talk. Did that go? Let's talk about Scholar Search. Uh, Scholar Search is the aggregated search engine uh, that BYU uses to help people find what we have in our holdings. Uh, one of the things that I always have to tell uh, students when they start a search in Scholar Search, and it is the place that they start, is that it is searching everything that BYU has access to. It's all the books that are on our shelves. It's the databases that we have access to. It's the articles that we have access to through subscriptions. It's many of the databases like Archive Space, which we use to describe our finding aids. It's searching our digital collections. So typically, when you run a search from the Scholar Search homepage at lib.byu.edu, you get a bunch of results. Uh, there are ways to narrow those results down, and I will show you a couple of those, but it's a great place to start. So when you're searching in Scholar Search, it, it allows for searching in a variety of different ways. You can search by individuals' names, you could search by family names, you can search by corporate entities. I've got a couple examples of names there, or you can search by topics and subjects. Uh, and I've uh, also picked the Colorado River uh, for a few of the results, but uh, also reclamation water dams. Uh, dams are a big issue in Utah. Uh, and, and I grew up in Idaho and dams are an even bigger issue in Idaho, particularly with the sportsman community. I have two brothers that are avid fly fishermen who wish that dams did not exist, uh, but that's another story. So this is the search page. Uh, when you go to lib.byu.edu, it's just a single search bar. Uh, you drop in your subject um, and you run a search. In this case, I've searched for uh, the Central Utah Conservancy District, and it's pulled back a few results. Um, and you'll see that there's an annual report, there's a construction report, there's, but what I want you to note there is there's 4,200 and something results. Uh, so that's quite a few results. But if you go to the next page, what you can do is not, not the next page, but along the side, along the left, there are some facets. And one of those facets is collection. And if you scroll down to the bottom of the collection, one of the facets is specific to special collections. And you click on that and it will re reduce the, the hits results. Usually it's far more dramatic than what happened to me when I was searching on the Conservancy District. Uh, usually I put in the term Mormon and I get 4 million hits and then I click on special collections and we're down to 40,000 hits, which is more manageable. Uh, in this case, it dropped the results to 3,000 something results because most of the material that we have related to the Central Utah Conservancy District is actually in special collections. The second thing you can do in terms of faceting is you can search by digital collections. And um, actually, I guess I've I've included one of the records here just so that you can get a sense for how you access materials. So our record gives you some basic information, but the important button is the green button. You click on that green button, it'll take you into a request management system. It ports over the call number information and sends that to special collections and we print the call slip. If, you used to, if you've been to BYU Special Collections before, we had these quadruplicate forms that you filled out one by hand, and if you had more than three items, you had writer's cramp by the time you were done filling out the, the information. This makes it so much more easy and simpler to use. The other reason I want to show the bottom of the record, and I point this out to students all the time, uh, the records have subject tracings. Catalogers don't think like the rest of us do, um, particularly the Library of Congress catalogers. Um, they use terms that I would not ever associate with something. And so I point out if you do a keyword search and you find a record of, that contains something that you're interested in, if you come down in the BYU catalog record to the subjects, you can click on that subject and it'll rerun the search for, particularly for those items uh, that you're interested, most interested in. Uh, the other thing you can do using that collections is you can facet to digital collections. This is particularly important for people who can't come to Provo 
uh, who are in other states or in other countries that are interested in the water resources that we have, they can identify what we have that's digitized. Uh, if you click on the green content DM link, it takes you to the, the base record um, and you can actually access the item itself. Uh, so here we've got the Central Utah Project. Um, I actually have not read that um, guide, but it, it's, it, there's probably about 50 pages there of information about the Central Utah Project Conservancy District. Uh, it's walking through what they do, why they do it. Uh, the one thing that I really do like that we've recently done, it used to be you just got the digital image. Now there's a kind of a, I guess it's a table of contents and you can click to different sections and it'll jump you directly into those different sections. Because each of these images, each document is scanned as multiple images. So it's a compound image. And so if it's 50 pages, it's 50 images that you're going through. So I'm not going to read these results. I just wanted to give you an example of some of the kinds of things that come up when you search the various topics. Uh, we have government reports. We have historical papers and things that are done about. Uh, so here we've got Leonard Arrington's reclamation in three layers. It's a history of the Ogden River project. Uh, we've got both federal reports as well as uh, Utah Division of Water Resources reports uh, for other topics. Uh, we've got books. Um, uh, the first one under dams is the proceedings of a conference um, talking about landslide dams, which is a, a type of dam. Uh, and then I won't go over uh, what we've got with the Colorado River, uh, but we've got a, an address that was given by George Dern um, talking about the compact and what they were aiming to, to accomplish there. The other thing that I will put out there is sometimes people don't want published materials. What they want to do is get to the manuscripts, the diaries, the letters that people have written about the different collections. Uh, BYU's aggregated search engine does search our archive space instance, which is where we have our descriptions. But if you just want the descriptions, you can go to archives.lib.byu and uh, search them here. Um, and I've run a couple of sample searches because the archive space does something that's really interesting. When you search water, you have records in archive space, both that are about an organization or about an individual. Uh, so they're essentially authority records. And then you actually have the finding aid itself or the various levels of the finding aid that can be described uh, in the record. In this case, I searched water. And what I want you to notice is the first five or six hits are all organizations or individuals that have water associated with them. And then it starts getting into the collections where it has the little red is where it's getting into collections. Um, if it's green, um, it means that it's a subcomponent of one of the collections. So I clicked into the record uh, for the, I believe this is the Rock Canyon Water Company. And typically where it says Rock Canyon Water Company, underneath it, there's a brief description of what the entity is or who the individual is or the family. And then it lists out all of the collections in our holdings that are related to that particular individual. In this case, there are two collections. Um, I followed one of the collections to get to the finding aid. Um, and you'll notice that there are some carrots next to the uh, navigation bar on the, I guess that's on your right. Um, and that'll open up the finding aid where you can drill down a little bit farther. But this gives you base information about the collection, what we have, um, and it, it provides an opportunity to access it. There's a little button up in the right-hand corner. It says Aon Request. That throws you back into our request management system and allows you to request access to these, those particular materials. Um, Archive Space can actually also function. A, it, it doesn't have an advanced search per se, but you can make it function in an advanced way. Uh, there's a little plus button um, next to the search bar. And every time you click that, it will add another bar beneath it. So you can have multiple things that you're searching on. Uh, in this case, I've done two. I'm searching on Wallace F. Bennett and then water to see what's related to Wallace F. Bennett and water. And it pulls back um, 300, let's see, what does that say? 122 records uh, related to water that Bennett, uh, they're in Bennett's collections. And this is Bennett's senatorial collection. Uh, so we have, well, it's a mix of both personal papers and then things that he brought home uh, from his service as senator. Whether or not he was supposed to bring stuff home is another story. Uh, but they always do. We, yeah, anyway, they don't understand public versus private sometimes. Um, 
the other thing you can do in archive space beyond just diving into the records and taking a look at what's there is you can search by digitized content as well. And in the Bennett collection, we have digitized a number of the records. Um, and if you were to follow this record, it would take you to a record that has a thumbnail. You can click on the thumbnail and it opens up uh, to allow you to see uh, the broader record. And so those are the two basic tools that we have uh, for accessing water rights, water related records at BYU. Most academic institutions have similar uh, tools. They'll have something that searches a finding aid or they'll have something that searches their aggregated catalog. Uh, the University of Utah and Utah State University participate in an entity called um, and I just blank, Archives West, and Archives West is where you can access their finding aids. Uh, and that's actually, that, I'll show you how that becomes useful to you to know and understand what Archives West is when we get into the Western Waters Digital Collection, which we'll do now. So Western Waters was a project uh, sponsored by the Institute for Museum and Library Science or Services IMLS and the National Endowment for the Humanities and then the Greater Western Library Alliance. Uh, it is a tool for aggregating uh, records from Western states and Western repositories about water related resources. Uh, and these is, this is just a short list of the kinds of things that you're gonna find in Western waters uh, in the digital library. Uh, the important thing to note about the Western Waters Digital Library, it's not behind a paywall, it is free and public, and it is meant to be accessible by anyone who wants to access any of this content. So to add the content to Western Waters, you're basically saying that we don't care if this is out and available, which is a fantastic thing. Uh, but it has what's referred to often as classic water literature, it'll have legal transcripts, maps, reports, personal papers, audio recordings, videos, it'll link out to a variety of finding aids at different institutions so you can get a sense for physical items that may not be digitized that might be related to water. Uh, it's a really powerful and useful resource when you're interested in water. Uh, this is just a, a base list of who the contributor, contributors are. Uh, most of the, well, all of them were uh, members of the Greater Western Library Alliance. There were several that were non-members. I want to point out that Brigham Young University, the University of Utah, Utah State University, Weber State University have all contributed content to the Western Waters Digital Library. There are a couple of ways to search uh, when you're in the Western Waters Digital Library. One is just a, a basic keyword search. Um, the other is their advanced search, and their advanced search allows you to search by particular repository types. Uh, or my personal favorite is you can browse by institution. You may know that you're interested in water records at the University of Colorado. You can go to that particular institution, click on the name, and it will pull up all of the records that are related to that institution. Uh, one thing I'll point out is the when it says all there next to the search, it's a bit misleading to me. I would have thought it was searching title, a scope note, a base record when it means all. When it says all, it's searching text, images, audio, and then finding aids. Uh, and so if you want to kind of be more granular in your search, you do need to use the advanced search. Um, I've searched the Central Utah Project um, in this particular example, and you'll see that it pulls back a bunch of finding aids. These are all collections that have information about the Central Utah Project that have not been digitized, but the finding aids available online and can help you understand what it is if you're planning a research trip to go and take a look at those particular materials. Uh, here's the advanced search. Uh, you'll notice that it lists out the different repositories you can search. So Archives West, again, this is where you would want to know that this is where the finding aids for Utah State and the University of Utah are. Um, there are a couple of other aggregators, but then you can search by different topical areas and kind of break it down into a more uh, granular search. Oops. And then this is just an example of the browse by institution. I'll go through this pretty quickly. I selected the BYU digital collections because that's where I work. Um, and then I selected the first item, just clicked into it to give you a sense for what it looks like and how it functions. Um, and it, you can see that there's a thumbnail over there. It gives you a brief description of what the item is. You click on the thumbnail and you go to the actual digitized content itself. And that's it for me. And so I will pass it on to Lisa. Great, I'm gonna have to figure out where I need to go to see my slides. Okay, well, hello, I'm Lisa Bart and I'm with the Utah Division of State History. Um, as Mahala mentioned that um, they do state archives, 
um, government archives. We are more personal archives, everything non-governmental. We get confused a lot, so I just wanted to preface that. So uh, first, in trying to do research for this presentation, like we have so many water resources, and our former colleague, Valerie, Valerie Jacobson, put together this great folder of water resources um, to help me um, produce this presentation um, before she before State Archives stole her. Uh, <laughs> um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just focusing on like three themes um, that we have in our archives, which will be um, Glen Canyon and river running, um, irrigation and canals, and then um, Great Salt Lake. Oh no. Okay. There we go, okay. So this, uh, this first slide is of the, the Neville's expedition. Um, Norman Nevis, Nelvis um, um, taking a Fox movie tone camera crew um, down the Glen Canyon, um, down the Glen Canyon um, and the Colorado River. And this is part of our classified photograph collection, which always comes in handy. Um, and, it's, and, it's always, and these are digitized as well. Um, and obviously this is pre-Glen Canyon Dam. And then here is another collection that's also digitized, which is the Alton Watson um, Morton collection. And he has a bunch of photographs um, of like Southern Utah and the Lane Canyon area, pre-dam. And he influenced a lot of like tourism in the area, early tourism. And we also have a great um, AV collection of him. Um, they used to take um, like puddle jumpers like into the canyon and then, and then start their river rafting. So we have that digitized um, in one of our exhibit, digital exhibits that I'll show you. So, you know, sometimes I feel like our, the artifact collection gets a little ignored. So we have Sabrina here, who's our artifact manager. And so I wanted to highlight a few of the artifacts that we have related to river running. And this is Charlie, uh, the river, um, this river raft. Um, so in 1938, the river raft was designed and commissioned by adventure filmmaker and journalist Amos Berg. Um, and it's first known, it's the first known inflatable raft uh, to float down the Colorado River and created a paradigm shift um, in boat designs um, in, river, in river running as a whole. So we, we, we love Charlie, and Charlie actually is at, um, is at the John Wesley Powell Museum currently because um, he's too big to soar for us and he has a good home there. So, but luckily, you know, with the artifact collections, we do have a lot of it, um, a lot of our artifacts that are photographed, so you can use these as primary sources as well. And so next we have another, uh, another artifact of, of an ore, and this belonged to Stephen Moulton, um, AKA Multi Babcock Fulmer, a river rafter enthusiast, um, who was the first, who was the, the first hundred documented US citizens to boat through the Grand Canyon on the Colorado River. Um, and he arrived at least there, leaves ferry 75 years after John Wesley Powell's expedition. And so next we have Glen Canyon Dam and so some of these are digitized, some are not. Um, this is, I believe, part of our classified photograph collection, but um, we do have um, Bureau of Reclamation records and photographs um, in our collection as well. And so this is Glen Canyon in uh, 1961 um, as, the, um, as the dam is um, just being built. And then we also have a Glen Canyon Dam digital exhibit. And this was produced um, with Melissa Coy, a former colleague of ours, and Professor Jeff Nichols, um, at Westminster College. Um, his class, um, actually, his American West class, they actually came in and did research and um, picked out these primary sources, did all the metadata, um, and then we digitized them. So um, I highly recommend checking this out. And it talks about like the pros and cons of the dam, um, the opponents of it, and, and whatnot. And you'll see here, this photograph is Gregory Crampton, who's a very famous um, Utah historian who documented the Glen Canyon Dam um, uh, before the dam came up. And so we also have quite a bit of irrigation and canal uh, records. And so this is a digital collection, which is the Salt Lake Engineers Photograph Collection. And this collection, you know, mostly is uh, Salt Lake Valley, um, just early like infrastructure development um, of like roads and canals, um, parks and whatnot. So this is another great water resource. We also have our CCC collection. Um, quite a bit of it is digitized. We have the newsletters, and then we also have a photograph collection as well. 
And here you'll see um, some CCC enrollees who are at Zion National Park uh, building irrigation canals. And here is another part of our classified photograph collection, which is the construction of the Highline Canal near Salem, Utah. Um, so this is very early, large um, um, irrigation infrastructure. And so here, I'm not going to read this all to you, obviously, but I just wanted to show an example of how many records we have on irrigation and, and canals, uh, specifically like irrigation company records. Um, these um, are, you can access online in our catalog, but you'd have to come into the research center to, um, to access them. And so we also have records. Um, here's an example of our pamphlets on the Central Utah Project, um, which is one of the largest um, water infrastructure projects um, in Utah. And probably our largest uh, collection related to the Central Utah Pro Project is kind of adjacent, but is the Strawberry uh, Water Users Association records. Um, it's from 1900 to 1970, so it's over 300. Um, it's over 300 boxes of correspondence and reports um, from state um, and federal agencies as well as local agencies. Um, and I, this is a really great collection because you know it does cover the Central Utah Project, but also covers what leading up to that. And so next, uh, I'm going to go over some Great Salt Lake uh, resources that we have. And this is a photograph collection we have that's digitized by George M. Ott um, Ottinger. And so he kind of went around Great Salt Lake and took a lot of um, landscape photos um, and tried to capture wildlife. And then here is another photograph from our classified uh, photograph collection of Antelope Island and work being done on there in the 1940s. And then we also have our Utah and the West postcard collection. I um, mean, they have a lot of great resources on Great Salt Lake and photographs um, that really capture like the tourism around Great Salt Lake. And then we also have some more artifacts. So we have some Great Salt Lake resort era swimwear um, that's in our artifact collection. Um, and also like, you know, things like this, we, these are all photographed, but if you ever wanna come into the archive and request that, you can request artifacts to look at the same as you can uh, like all of our documents. And then we have our, sol our solitary digital exhibit that Melissa Coy also created. Um, and it covers kind of like the cultural history of Saltaire and the events that happened and its legacy. Um, she, she spent a great, a great amount of time on this and it's, it's really beautiful. And so here's just another example of a few of the um, collections we have related to Great Salt Lake. And these are not digitized, but they're available in our catalog um, to request before you come in. And so now I'm gonna just briefly go over um, how to access our collection. Um, it gets, it gets kind of confusing. So um, hopefully I'll, I'll clear things up. So this is our, um, this is our homepage, uh, history.utah.gov. And then I have that drop down um, screen, screenshot. And then you go, and then you, so then you go to library and collections. And then that will take you to our collections databases. So we have a few, and that's, that's why it gets confusing. So we have our collections, digital exhibits, and, um, and digital collections. And so for things that are not digitized, you wanna go to collections. And then this takes you to this page, which is the library catalog and artifacts catalog, and then um, Utah Digital Newspapers. And so I just wanna focus that the library catalog Pretty much holds everything but the artifacts it holds it holds the manuscripts the photographs the pamphlets the publications architectural drawings i know sometimes it gets confusing that if it's a library catalog then we if there's only publications in there but that's where you want to go um, for all the records that you want to research and then we also have our artifact collection so if you click on that then it takes you to this and so then you can keyword search um, this is the home page right now we usually highlight um, some of the uh, exhibits that we've created. And you can keyword search um, and kind of go into advanced search as well. And then we also have our digital collections, which had its own, which had its own tab. And so um, you can either search by the collections, by collections that we have, like example down at the bottom, or you can go into the search our digital collections and keyword search. And it also takes you to the Marriott homepage. Um, that's where our digital collections are housed. So and you can search by year, subject, you know, whatever you, whatever you want to do. And then we also have our digital exhibits as well. And 
um, you can you can browse by item and collection um, or by exhibit. So, and we have so many more resources for you. Like I said, um, if you have any questions, um, you can email the research center. I have to preface: we are currently moving our collection right now. We're moving out of the Rio Grande into a location on 7290 South State Street in Midville. We hope to be open by early 2023. So, and then we can start taking appointments for you to come in and, um, and look at our collections. So, but in the meantime, you can still email us with any questions you have, um, and we can put you on a list for, to get back to you for when we open. And also, I mentioned that uh, water-related resources folder that Valerie created. Um, if you email me, I'm happy to share it with you. It has uh, beyond the resources that I shared. There's also resources on flooding, the Bear River, Jordan River, et cetera. So that's all I have. I don't need the clicker. Um, so I'm the oddball on this, this group. Um, I'm from Uinta County Library and History Center and Museum, where lots of hats in rural Utah, which is kind of a common thing when you get away from, when you get into rural areas. I see Meg in the room, who's, a, who's an assistant library director and uh, principal of the, the Returning Rapids Project and others. And, and we wear lots of hats. And I encourage you to go to that session in the next hour, I think, because um, it's awesome. And because they helped us out on the project that I'm gonna, gonna tell you about. So um, raise your hand if you know who Roy Webb is. Okay, for those that don't know, he's the Utah River historian, mic drop. And um, a couple of years ago, he came to us and he said, hey, for 20 years, I've been trying to work with the with A.K. Reynolds family. They have two river boats that were used in Flaming Gorge before the dam was built. And it's a really cool thing. And the family's concerned about legacy. Um, he was like this close, this, this is wearing a museum hat right now, okay? Um, he was like this close to getting A.K. and his wife Ellen to donate the boats in 1980 something. And then they got old, passed away, and then their kids inherited the homestead. They have three kids. Um, homestead's real close to Flaming Gorge Dam. And there's this outbuilding with these two boats. And here it is now, you know, towards the end of the kids' lives. Hopefully they're around for a long time to come, but you never know. Um, but they're, they're um, contemplating their legacy and their parents' legacy and saying, hey, we've got these boats in this garage and our kids don't know the stories and they didn't really know their grandparents. And um, we're really concerned about this, this legacy and our family history. And um, two more years goes by, COVID happens. We're trying to negotiate, do we want this stuff? And, and if you haven't been involved with... Um, I hate to use the, the term acquiring in museum collections, but if you haven't been involved in becoming entrusted with a family's legacy, it can be a thorny, wormy, hairy process. And we all have this perfect world where um, we go to these classes and a seasoned professor tells you, when you get to the point of the deed of gift, never make any exceptions. These are the rules. They're vetted by the lawyers, and they're written that way for a reason. This is true. And yet, sometimes we go back to those lawyers and we say, this is an important legacy that no one else knows about, and we've got to take some extra steps to, to um, preserve that legacy and make this family feel comfortable. I, I tell you this, um, I'm going to show a documentary that we put together with partners. Um, Cody Perry, Rig to, Rig to Flip Films, is the filmmaker on this. But it shows the story of the Reynolds, of A.K. Reynolds, his boats, their, some of their family legacy. And um, we, have, we have records in the archives related to the river. Um, we've been digitizing things for 20 some odd years. We were one of the founding members of the, what became the Mountain West Digital Library. Um, and yet, 
as widely used as it is in our collections in there are in the greater research community, locally, it wasn't getting used. It wasn't known. There was some random guy who started posting pictures from our collections on Facebook, you know, and, and kind of passing them off on his own, whatever, we don't really care. Complete, complete with the typos from our metadata. So, you know, it's like, thank you. But the trackback link, that would be awesome if you could. Um, but, but it kind of opened up this discussion a few years ago with what ways can we involve local communities more, our community, more with the history and heritage and resources that we've collected. And a couple of things came to mind, better tools. Um, we've worked, um, as have a couple other libraries, Grand County, on new discovery layers for our catalogs that allow people to search local holdings and also whatever we might have at the Mountain West Digital Library or any other thing. I'm not here today to talk about those tools, but they're cool and you can ask Meg or me about them later. Um, they're really cool. They're super cool. Okay, enough, enough, uh, enough said. Um, well, without further ado, if you would kindly um, push play. Thank you. This is face. Our ranch up uh, by the Red Kagan Lodge. Dad always wanted to, to go back to river running, never did. I decided not to restore these, but to preserve them. It'd be great to see one in a museum or you know, for both of them in a museum. Well, it's going to happen, gals. It's going to happen. This is very exciting. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> It's intense. Yeah, this is this is totally amazing to see them out here now. To see them this intact, and actually they're in better shape than I thought. It was so exciting. What if two scary things has been accomplished? Now if we can get them unloaded. That, that's the next scariest thing. So.
It's in really good condition for having been stored for 50 years. How's it looking? Are we cracking? Okay. Way better shape than expected. Generally, how good the paint, varnish, fiberglass, wood is, the screws, I mean, everything's fairly intact. And he always went in but first i always thought that that's where they had control <laughs> you know where they went in this way this gives you the feel you know the feel that the feel of my dad's back i have these sitting in a, a shed all these years is kind of sad i mean these are active boats they've got a life to them and that's what we're bringing back is the life to these boats and that's how i feel that it's really important this honest goodness is probably my first time ever in this boat i'm hey, thinking about this missile yeah i wish we we're all could turn back time to Ask them the questions we never did. Be one of the very first few people to start a business of running the river that nobody did for fun. It was all exploration but to actually just do it for fun. Very first time sitting in either of these boats. I can almost feel the rush of the water. The thrill of going down a rapid. It's just, this is unbelievable. It takes me back to when dad started doing this. Just get to know him in a different way. Think about what it was like for him back then versus what I got to know him when he was older. It was a different part of his life that I never really got to know. Really looking forward to seeing one of these in the museum. So we just got the boats out, then we swept and vacuumed the boats. The whole goal is then to figure out what a finished boat looks like. Is it going to be a boat that we can take downstream, or is it a boat that we just put in a museum that looks kind of like these ones right now? Uh, we've been working at the museum now for a year and a half to try and come up with an agreement uh, where we wanted to make the uh, boats really bad. We wanted to see that legacy preserved. Um, the last thing that had to happen was uh, for the museum to come up here today and actually take a look at the boats, get them out, see if they want to accept them. And at this point, I'm taking it that they want to accept them. So now we're here just to sign the uh, agreement, uh, basically the the donation agreement that we are officially now donating the boats and the oars and the motor yeah. to the museum. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the cataract boat is unique. Cataract boat was designed by North Devils, and the shape of it was punt like. Norm had run a couple of trips on the San Juan and decided to build the cataract boat. This is a really an original design from Neville's. It had the rake to make it more maneuverable so it could turn. In rapids, and you ran it the same way. You sat in the boat, face down, and then you were to punch your stuff. The rest of the 
It's a kind of gap time. There's a newspaper interview there, a guy named Adrian Riddles in Greenville, Wyoming. Adrian Riddles' son, who is also named Adrian, but they always called him AK, was so fascinated by it that he, he writes to Neville and says, I'd like to build some of these boats. Can you send me the plans? Norm says, sure. AK used those specifications to build a, a cataract boat. AK Reynolds built two. And they were copies of each other, pretty much exact. But he kind of started up with his brother-in-law. He started up a little company he called Reynolds Hallisey River Expeditions. And they ran almost exclusively on the upper Grand. In 1950, they did a, a kind of a promo film trip for the for the railroad, where the, the railroad wanted to advertise this is where you go. You know, you could go visit Yellowstone, or you could do this, or you could go to Green River and take a river trip. The Grand Sea at that time was unknown. It was never full. So in the winter, it was low, it was full, it froze over. And in the spring, when the the sources in the, the snow in the Winterberg Mountains melted, the grain could run really good, 20, 25,000. And once you got to Ashley Falls, all that water made it just a gigantic rapid. I mean, the big rock is still sticking up out of it. It's kind of a big triangular shaped rock. It was so well known that it became the thing everybody worried about. It was almost like a rite of passage. What's cool about it is that you can't see it anymore. It's under 500 feet of water now because the flaming gorge damage is down there. Had it not been flooded, it would have become one of those names that all modern river runners are familiar with, like the Big Drops or Hell's Half Mile, Warner Springs, things like that. But the, those particular ones, it's really poignant to see because you know that that's gone. Uniquely enough, these were the first plywood boats to really be run down on the Colorado River Basin in large quantities. The starting boats for an evolution of design that at this point is considered somewhat the gold standard. If you can get real close up over here, it's really faint and in red, but you might make out the G and the A, and down here the Y of Galloway. So it's looking at things like the joinery here, the thickness and width of the outer gunnel here, looking at the different frame members and how they were designed and built. And also looking for unique things like maybe where there's things were repaired after a big hit. Yeah, we just kind of have to dab, dab, dab instead of rub. So I love it because it's a part of my community's history, but it's part of my history. I grew up here. I never knew about the Reynolds boats. I'm excited about these boats in order to tell more about the river history of the area and the importance of the river, not just for agriculture, but for um, recreation purposes and how important that is. River recreation here is awesome, because it is a part of history.
these, this is um, part of the river history, part of Flaming Gorge history, part of Nagin County's history, part of Uintah County's history. Like most of us, you know, you, you go on your first river trip and you're like, oh my God, like, I want to do more of this. I build a boat that's going to go bang off rocks in these whitewater rivers anymore. A good strong wind. When they approached rapids, they turned and faced the stern downstream, facing your danger. If you have rocks coming up with with a flat bottom boat, you have stability and you have the with and with the added rocker, you have the ability to turn the boat quickly, face your danger, and row away from it. Reynolds boats were, were great whitewater boats for their era. What's magical about boats and rivers to me is the movement and the question it evokes. Where did it come from? Where does it go? What does it see? Just that feeling of being on the water and having a constantly moving landscape. That's what's so magical to me about river running, is that you're on your own. Well, this is the end of a long journey and a start of a new journey. We uh, started a couple of years ago to donate uh, my dad's and mom's boats. Uh, they were river runners, and today they're actually enjoying one of them at the museum. So it's a pretty exciting time. You know, the family history that you take for granted and then look back and see what we've learned. And it's very exciting, very exciting to be able to share it with others. Today, we are actually going to unveil one of the boats that we donated to the museum. I was the only one that got to ride in the boat. You know, I think I was four years old, you know, when that happened. But I feel their presence here. We ready? <laughs> curves and the shapes and the spared lines of a, a wooden boat are just really pleasing to the eye. It's just a throwback to simpler times in some ways. It's great to see it all preserved and, and now on display for river runners to be able to, to see from this point on. So, so satisfying to me, so fulfilling to see them come here and where now they can be seen. They're going to be on display. They're going to be interpreted. People are going to know that part of, uh, of this area's river recreation history.
thank you for doing your best with that. Um, it was it was an amazing project to be part of, and we're using archival resources. You can see um, so much of what we use was discovered in the process of working with the the Reynolds family. They discovered in the process of finding out what they had in mom and dad's files that they had the footage from that Union Pacific uh, promotional trip. And um, they, um, they used a, a residential grade <laughs> processor. So it cut off, the, cut off the edges. And so we have some work to do. We're, we're gonna work through another organization to make sure that that, that film um, can live somewhere in the long run that, that can take care of it. And um, most likely the University of Utah with uh, Roy's connections there. But um, there, are, there are many, many stories out there. And you saw today a lot of slides and search tools and collections. And for a moment, when you think about those, I want, to, want you to think about all the individuals who wrote letters back and forth, all the people that had these headaches at the end of the day because they're just trying to figure out how on earth to make whatever it was happen to, to fill their organization's goal. But these, these records that we have that live in Hollinger boxes and bankers boxes and, and reports and things, they're all made by people. And I encourage you to use these amazing research tools that are available free to use for the most part to, to dig in there, find those stories of those people, those organizations, our fellow humans who are just trying to do the best they can on this green earth. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. So we have about 15 minutes left. Um, if there was any questions, we have a microphone right there since we are recording this. So uh, you can ask questions to any of our panelists here, although they did make it very clear and obvious, I think, through their presentation. <laughs> any questions? Okay, well, feel free to come up and talk, talk with them. Um, we also have a bunch of these. These are the Archives Month water uh, posters this year. There's three of them, the Bridal Veil Falls, Great Salt Lake, and Colorado River. So um, please take these and you can decorate your office with them. Yeah.